Where's Kelvin? I will not in. Let's see. Okay, give me a second. Okay, today we're going to continue with um, uh, recursive, right? Okay, we're going to continue with what we have uh, left out last week. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure what happened to um, Calvin. Shall we wait for him or we continue? Maybe we can give him a two minutes, sir. Right? But okay. Uh, Actually, today will be my last session with you. Okay, Kelvin's here. Uh, my last session with you and uh, Kelvin because uh, a colleague of mine is going to take over. As you can see in the coursework, there is another teacher coming in. That's Mr. Jeffer. Mr. Jeffer is going to teach you guys uh, next week onwards, I think, yeah. So uh, from this week, this week is the last week. So it's going to be uh, this last, I'm talking about the last topic would be uh, chapter seven. Okay, let's see. Um, let's just, hang on, let me just project that coursework. Coursework, last plan, yeah. Not this one. Just recursive with my cost line. Oh, uh, not that one. Okay, wait a second. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Okay, so if you can see, we are basically following our cost plan, right? We have gone through everything here, week one, until week seven. Now, this week, we are going to do recursion, okay? So um, recursion for lecture, and then uh, we try to see what you have done for the previous week on uh, our practical. All right, so I'm going to start uh, returning to you and Kelvin, whatever you have done uh, since week one until week seven. Yeah, so you'll expect to get back whatever you have submitted. And the markings for that as well by the end, uh, maybe the end of this week or uh, starting next week. Yeah. Okay, so then Mr. Jeffrey is going to take over. So uh, if you have any other questions which is related to uh, practical or you, know, you are doing assignment, right? Assignment, the previous uh, chapter, you can ask me, and the one which is successive chapter you may ask Mr. Jeffer because he is going to do be doing your test yeah um, we'll be conducting a test for you all right so I'm not sure when is the test going to be um, usually test is going to be on week nine but I'm not sure when is your test going to be he will be mentioning and telling you guys about this next week yeah and then also he is going to be the one who's uh, going to um, conduct the test with you guys. And um, a note to remember. Remember I gave and I uh, actually attach. I'm going to show you, yeah, attach. This pretty practical questions. Okay, there are a lot of pre-practical questions here. These are related to what we have learned every chapter. Okay, so uh, I have put here, uploaded here one, three, four, and five pre-practical. I will be uploading more until seven, yeah, another three. So I want you to actually um, go through, just for knowledge sake, and then um, because this is a practical version, I mean, yeah, theoretical version. 
each step, each um, chapter we go through, we will go, we will go through all this. You have to go through this one just for your revision. Okay. Apart from the coding, uh, this is what you should be looking at. Uh, you call it before going to class. All right. So here it says, um, for example, the last chapter which we gave, I, I gave you in the thing, in the coursework, is this here? Um, explain the steps that needs to be carried out in the push and pop operation when stack is implemented using link implementation with reference to the top entry. Okay. So these questions are given based on your uh, activity which you did during your lecture and also during your practical. So if you have done your practical or if you understand what your lecture is all about, therefore you can actually give your answer here. All right. So uh, this is what it is given to you. All right. Okay. Stop on that one. Right. Wait a second, yeah. Elvin, are you okay? You keep coming in and out. Something wrong with your network? Uh, something wrong with your connection? Is Kelvin in? Oh, yeah. Something wrong with your connection, Kelvin, today? We are going to go quickly on this, yeah? Hmm? Where's Calvin? Back up? He, he left. left. Oh boy. Okay, never mind. Hang on, let me just sort, sort out something first, yeah? Just question. Okay, uh, you see, as you can see here, Uh, you know, whenever I give you exercises, right, we are not actually supposed to show you the answer, but we're supposed to tell you whether or not you did the right thing. Uh, guide you and tell you whether that answer that you have given is uh, correctly given, right? So um, that's why, because sometimes most of the examinations are coming up from there. So if you were to be given the answer exactly, that means you have a script with you. Then therefore, as you uh, seen the one which I showed you earlier in the pre-practical class mission, um, you are going to be considered as cheating cases because you have the script with you. That's why we do not risk to give you the answer script, but to discuss with you whether or not your answer, that's what I'm going to do. Um, marking of your answer, if you submit that during your practical um, and give it back to you after that. All right. So um, I hope that when I give you all the codes, yeah, the sample codes, it is okay if you implement that and um, modify the codes uh, to suit your answer for that particular question. But don't do... Um, like I said before, don't do copying straight from the paper, which means straight from the sample and uh, copy it straight into that, that uh, answer of yours. Yeah, you have to modify a little bit, change your variable, change the name or whatsoever. Uh, the, the, pro the main purpose for giving you is that to enable you to give you a um, reference so you can actually uh, understand uh, how it works. Okay, in a code. Calvin is back. Hello, Calvin. How are you? Hopefully, okay. Your connection no good? Uh, yeah, hopefully, no, no more never error. Mm, it's okay. Hopefully not, yeah? Okay, so we were actually discussing, We are, I'm actually telling um, Noel that this will be my last week with you. And then if you notice in the coursework people under teachers, yeah, there are one more uh, teacher has been added in. I added in one 
because he is the one who is going to be with you for the next um, week eight onwards. Okay, so whatever I discuss with you in the class uh, this week will be my last session, and then but if you have any questions which regards to your previous exercises or I'm going to be returning your exercises which you did in um, uh, week one until week seven, okay? And then uh, make comments on how you did it. So if there is a problem, you may also WhatsApp me, okay? Uh, for whatever it is before. But whatever it is exercises after that, which is um, handled by Mr. Jeffer, you may continue asking uh, that particular questions which you have, if you have any, to him. Yeah. Otherwise, you can answer. Uh, you can ask anything that is before chapter eight to me. All right. Although I'm no longer there, but I'm still trying to. I'm still processing whatever you have uh, given me until I finish that. So then only I will be uh, completely maybe. Um, not going to be in the in the system for for after I conclude with my task. All right, are we clear? Mm, okay. But you have my number. You can WhatsApp me. You have my email. My email another alternative email would be p a u t h e n p authentic. Yeah, let me just type that out. If you have any questions, if I'm not using uh, tar. What's our uh, email? Yes, you can. See. This is my alternative email, yeah. Mm. So any issues, you can WhatsApp. Uh, if it is too long to WhatsApp, then you can email. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we are going to go towards the um, recursive. So this recursive is um, there are a lot of uh, code which I have shared with you. If you notice, yeah, I've shared to you the code for recursive, but because it is quite long, I did not put it up. But I uh, put it up in the coursework. Okay, if you need like explanation for that, I have actually. Uh, put it also inside my uh, lecture notes. But anyway, just to confirm with you, did you receive all my lecture notes from the previous chapter, the first chapter until chapter six? Not chapter six. Um, yeah, yeah, chapter six. Did you have all the collection? Because my lecture note would be a little bit um, different than the one which is I uploaded because simply because I added more points and I added a video to enhance your understanding of the concept. I hope you uh, have it. Yeah. Is it the yeah. modified version? Yes, the updated version. So I don't put it up in coursework because I don't want it to interfere with the system in the in the coursework. Okay, I. Whatever is mine, whatever is extra for me, I will give straight to the student. I don't put it into the system so as they don't mix with whatever is given by the faculty. Okay. What my purpose to, to give you that extra note is so that you can understand further. Yeah. Of course, that is all in the syllabus. It's all in the syllabus. I just gave you extra so that you can understand further. Okay. So... I hope you have it all, yeah? So easy for you to refer if you have an uh, exam. I think for you, your, yeah, I'm not sure, yeah? But you may ask uh, this Mr. Jaffer if you have tests for that. But mainly, yeah, tests, maybe exam. Maybe usually a uh, test is on a week nine. Okay, never mind. Let's start with the lecture, yeah? So last week, we did our lecture on this one. As usual, I'll be turning off my video because it's going to be heavy on my load. Let's start it off, yeah? Okay. Uh... All right. 
So I have actually the recording function. Uh, I need to load that up. I hope this can run because the system gets heavy and heavy if I load so many things in here with the Google Meet. As you notice, we don't have any more uploaded Google Meet videos. That's because my system is not able to support the last few days. So I have uh, recently formatted my laptop and I finally managed to install this recording function. So, but you know, so many function at one location and then it's all going to be projected means I have a heavier system. So one more thing is that I need to put up my system to cool. All right, so okay. So this week, chapter seven, we're going for again the recap of half of the recursions, chapter six. Okay, on week uh, seven. It's supposed to be chapter seven for week seven. But anyway, it's chapter six, it doesn't matter. Title is recursion. So what is the learning outcome that you should have? Uh, at the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the concept of recursion. What is recursion? Yeah, solve a problem using recursion. There are many methods on how you basically uh, create a recursion, okay? And then how are you going to stop that recursion from recurring, you know? Those are how you solve it. Um, okay, then after that, how you trace a recursive method call, okay? Uh, and then analyze the efficiency of a recursive solution as compared to other alternative solution. So um, other recursive, other alternative solution would be that iterative method. Okay, so you will compare which one is more efficient in comparison to itself. You know, whether or not you should use recursive or you should use iteration. Next one question is, what is recursion? If you have seen a previous lecture or uh, sample codes on this one, uh, should, you should be able to get yourself familiarized with what is this concept on recursion. It's here, it says a problem solving process that breaks a problem into identical but smaller problem. Problem. So it's basically calling itself until a problem is uh, reached into so, uh, the, the solution. Okay, eventually it says here you reach a smallest problem where there is a direct solution. Okay, uh, that will be given in the next slide under different uh, illustration of how this is basically explained. Using that solution basically en enables you to solve previous problems. Okay, and then eventually the original problem uh, is solved. So this is how recursion is uh, used and how it can help to solve problems. So what is recursion? Right, next one. Recursion is an alternative to iteration. Okay. Uh, it is a very powerful way to solve certain problems for which solution would be otherwise very complicated. Here are two methods which you can use basically recursion and iteration. Iteration is a loop, right? Recursion is basically almost similar to iterative, but it is calling itself a function within it. Uh, itself calling itself so it produces a smaller version of itself until you reach to a certain uh, value the smallest that can solve a problem so that is uh, iteration and recursion right so this is a video about what is recursion we have seen this last week right we are going to skip on that one 
yeah, because there are other videos that you can watch on what is recursion. Yeah, so I'm going to skip on this one for now. So we're going to jump straight into our terminology. So in this topic, you are going to be exposed to a lot of this terminology which regards to your recursion. So number one, recursion, again, that is a word that is a process of solving problem by reducing it to smaller versions of itself. And then recursive definition, what is recursive? So recursive means something is defined in terms of smaller version of itself. Okay, that is recursive. What is a stopping case? So when you actually create a program with, by using recursion, right? That particular program is going to keep calling itself over and over and over again. So until uh, it will never stop unless you put a stopping case to it. So what happened if the, the program keep calling itself over and over? Uh, if you put it into a smaller value, it will be fine. But if you put it as large, larger, the larger the value becomes, then um, you might be running out of space, uh, memory. So therefore, you, you're going to experience a stack overflow. So it is essential that you put a stopping case. That's why this terminology stopping case is basically the case for which solution is obtained directly. You want to put a stop to that recursiveness. Yeah, so what is recursive case? Recursive case is that uh, algorithm for which problem is specified as smaller version of the original problem. So that is your recursive case. Okay, you, you are basically putting a uh, algorithm that you use to execute recursiveness in your program. That is a recursive case. And then you refer recursive algorithm, okay? That recursive algorithm will find solution to a given problem, okay, by reducing the problem to a smaller version of itself. Okay, there are, it depends on what's, uh, what problem you're trying to solve. You create your own uh, recursive algorithm, yeah? And then recursive method, a method that calls itself, okay? The body of the recursive method contains the statement that causes the same method, okay, method, calling another method of its own self to execute before completing the current call. Okay, so when you have a body of your program, inside the body will have a method uh, call, calling the function of recursive. You will need to first finish that, it says here, it has to execute before completing the current call. And then recursive algorithm are implemented using recursive method. So finish the one inside, and then only it will return to the main program. That is a recursive method. OK, next slide. So this one we have touched also last week. Um, example of your recursive program, you can apply here where is this coming gone again oh Calvin is here okay okay that I got the wrong message then. the message is delayed okay never mind yeah okay so he's okay okay so example factorial four, okay? So in iterative solution would be like this, yeah? Factorial four, it would be calling of itself until it becomes smaller and smaller and reach, uh, reach a solution, all right? So this is the formula in general. The factor, factor, factorial of zero would be in, uh, defined as one, okay? This is what is a... Uh, um, stated for zero. Okay, you cannot uh, ask why is this like this because this is just how it should be. It is a formula for that. 
right? And formula for factorial of n would be similar to this, basically. So it is defined as n uh, times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc., etc. Okay, for n is more than 0. Okay, so that is basically keep incrementing from 1 to here until it reaches factorial of 4. Okay, so this is your example of factorial, which is um, describing the recursiveness in iterative solution. Okay, so this is your solution for recursive example. Yeah. Four, factorial four would be simply put as four times three. Actually, it's supposed to be longer, but if it is defined as this, therefore you can actually say it four times three because you, you don't want to put more of the other values such as this and this that comes this. So you just simply put it because it is all equivalent to 1. So therefore, 4 times 3 is uh, the answer for factorial 4, 12, right? So what is the factor of 3? This is defined as 3 multiplied by uh, times 2, which is 6. Yeah, next one. So similar to that. It becomes smaller and smaller. Okay, if it is 2, then 2 multiplied times 1. 1 times 0. So if you can see this, it becomes smaller and smaller until it reaches the end. Until the end uh, of definition, which is the factorial of 0. That is basically 1. Okay, so longer version. This is what happened here. When you have this, 1 times 0 would be factorial of 0 is 1. Okay. Then you have to bring it over at this side, which is here. So that is 1. 1 will go here, which is for factorial of 2. Then therefore you get the 2 because you multiply this 2 times 1 equals 2. 3 times 2 equals 6, which is this. Okay, so value basically added up like this, yeah, incrementally from the bottom. Put it up here, such as this, and this one will be up here, and this will be up here, and this will be up here, and eventually it gets this answer. So basically, this is the logic of how all these steps are calculated, and then finally, you can compute it as this solution. For your problem, which is referring to the whole thing here. All right, so that is uh, just a solution uh, to make it simpler. Okay, so that's why it says in general. Hey everyone. hey everyone, in this video, I'm going to give you an introduction to recursion. So in general, it says here, your factorial of 0 is equivalent to 1. Factorial of n, which is representing of all these, would be, this is your formula, n times n minus 1. For n is more than 0, more than 0, which is 1. So therefore, it keeps increasing. Okay, so, okay, this is the uh, recursive Vector and Fibonacci illustration of how you put it in the code. Uh, maybe we can hear and uh, listen to him. I will skip if it is too long. Okay, we will just look into the uh, part where it is um, related to what we're trying to discuss and show you.
Hey everyone, in this, in video, this video, I'm gonna, I'm give, gonna you give you an introduction, introduction to recursion. recursion. So, so in computer in science, science, recursion, recursion is, a is a way of solving, solving a problem by having, having a function called call itself. itself. To see how, to that, see works how that works exactly, exactly let's, take let's take a look at a few examples here. First of all, let's think about factorials. And let's just quickly review factorials here. If you're given a positive integer n, n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times and so on down to 3 times 2 times 1. So I'm just going to give you a few examples here. 4 factorial is equal to 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 24. And 2 factorial is equal to 2 times 1, which is 2. And 1 factorial is 1. And what about 0 factorial? It's actually defined to be 1. And uh, you might say, why is that? But you know, basically that's just how it's defined. And let's just say here, we're trying to write a function called, let's say, fact, which takes a positive integer or 0 as its argument and returns the nth factorial. And let's say we want to write this function using recursion. How can we do that? To solve this problem or to write this function recursively, we need to actually examine this equation in a little bit more detail. Okay, so I brought that equation over here. And like we saw earlier, we had n factorial being equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and so on, times 3 times 2 times 1. And when you see this equation, and when you look at this part following the first n, you might notice that, that this part is equivalent to n minus 1 factorial. And that might be more obvious if I write it separately here as n minus 1 factorial equals n minus 1 times n minus 2 times and so on times 3 times 2 times 1. So this whole thing is equivalent to this part. So you might say, well, we can rewrite n factorial as n times n minus 1 factorial. And that's good. This new equation is mostly correct. But it's not a complete definition of factorials. Let's see why. Let's say if you plug in 2 to n right here, it works just fine because you'll get 2 factorial being equal to 2 times 2 minus 1 factorial, which is 1 factorial. And 1 factorial is 1, so 2 times 1 factorial is 2, and that's correct. What if you plug in 1 here? It's still good because you get 1 factorial being equal to 1 times 1 minus 1 factorial, which is 0 factorial. And 0 factorial is 1, as we saw earlier. So that's 1. And this is correct. But as soon as you plug in 0 here, it breaks. Let's see how that works. 0 factorial is equal to 0 here, right here, times 0 minus 1 factorial, which is minus 1 factorial. And minus 1 factorial is not defined. So this definition works only for n that is greater than or equal to 1, but it doesn't work for 0. So actually, for this definition to be called, to write n factorial as two separate cases. So here, we're going to write n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial if n is greater than or equal to 1. And if that's not the case, or if n is equal to 0, I wrote otherwise here, n factorial is equal to 1. And this is actually a complete definition of all factorials for all positive integers and 0. So let's just quickly see how we can use this new definition of factorials to find the factorial of any positive integer, let's say 3. So if you ask yourself, what's 3 factorial? There are two ways of answering that question. The first one would be to use the old definition, and then the second way would be to use this new definition. And let's use this new definition here, because we're going to use this new definition later to write a function using recursion as well. So using this definition, we can ask ourselves, what's 3 factorial? Well, 3 is greater than or equal to 1. So by definition, this is equal to 3 times 3 minus 1 factorial which is 2 factorial. And then we can ask ourselves, what's 2 factorial? By definition, since 2 is still greater than or equal to 1, 
it's equal to two times one factorial. And then we can do the same thing for one. What's one factorial? Well, it's one times zero factorial. And then as soon as we have this, we'll know that zero factorial is one by definition. And as soon as you have that, you can plug one to zero factorial here. And then you'll know that one factorial is equal to one times one, which is one. And then you can plug that back in here. And then you say, okay, two factorial is two times one, which is two. So we can plug that back in here. And then we'll say three factorial is three times two factorial, which is two. So the answer here is three factorial is three times two, which is six. Okay, now this whole process might seem a little bit silly, but this kind of thinking is gonna be actually the basis for implementing the function we wanted to implement earlier recursively, fact of n. And fact of n, as I said earlier, is going to take n, which is either a positive integer or zero, and it's gonna return n factorial. So let's see how we can implement it using recursion. And actually, all you need to do for that is you need to translate this new definition of factorials into code. So let's just bring this definition up here. So like we saw earlier, n factorial is equal to n times n minus one factorial if n is greater than or equal to one, and then it's one otherwise or equal to zero. And then we're gonna translate this definition directly into code and I'm gonna use Java here just as an example. And like we saw earlier, we're trying to write a function called fact, which is going to take n, an integer, and it's gonna return an integer, which is gonna be n factorial. And just for simplicity here, I'm gonna assume that the given n is always positive or zero. So it's never negative. And to write the rest of the function, it's pretty simple. We just need to translate this formal definition into code. So here it says n factorial is equal to n times n minus one factorial if n is greater than or equal to one. And what we're gonna return from this function is gonna be the value of n factorial. So here we just need to write, if n is greater than or equal to one, we're going to return n times fact of n minus one. So this is the same as saying the value of factorial n is going to be n times factorial of n minus one, if n is greater than or equal to one. And then we're gonna write otherwise or else, that's when n is equal to zero, we're just gonna return one because we know that that's the value of zero factorial. So as you can see, this is a recursive function because this calls itself, fact calls itself right here to solve the problem of finding n factorial. Okay, this function seems pretty simple, but does it actually work? Well, it does. To see how, let's take a look at a few examples here. If you have fact of zero, I just wrote it as f of zero. That's pretty easy because here we get this line right here because zero is not greater than or equal to one. So we're just gonna return one, which is correct because one is zero factorial. And what if you're given one as n? Then I'm just gonna write f of one here to stand for fact of one. When this is called, it's gonna hit this line right here because n is equal to one. And then it's gonna try to return one times fact of one minus one, which is zero. So f of zero here. And then when f of zero is called, it's gonna go to this right here that we saw earlier. And then f of zero will say, okay, my value is one. So this is gonna return one. And then in f of one, it's gonna say, okay, well, what I'm going to return is one times the value of fact of zero, which is one. So we're gonna return one times one, which is one. So that's the correct answer. Okay, to help you understand this a little bit better, I'm gonna give you another example here. Let's say fact of four is called I'm just gonna write f of four here. And when it's called, we go to this line right here. And since n, which is four, is greater than or equal to one, it's gonna say, what I wanna return from that function is four times fact of three. But we don't know what the value of fact of three should be, so we need to call that function. 
So I just wrote it here. Here I'm saying the value of f of 4, the return value of f of 4 will be 4 times f of 3. And then we need to call f of 3 to find the return value for that. Hey everyone! In one of my previous videos, but the Fibonacci okay, that's two times one, so that's the correct answer. Okay, two, but we don't know what the value of factor of three should be, so we need to call that function. So I just wrote it here. Here I'm saying the value of f of four, the return value of f of four, will be four times f of three, and then we need to call f of three to find the return value for that. And once we call f of three, the same thing will happen. The return value of f of 3 will be 3 times f of 2, whatever the return value of f of 2 is. So we'll call f of 2, or fact of 2. And then we'll say, okay, that's 2 times f of 1, actually, there's a typo here, whatever the return value of f of 1 is. So we'll call f of 1, and then f of 1 is 1 times f of 0, and then as soon as we call f of 0, we go to this line like we saw earlier, so we'll just return 1 from that. Once we return 1 from f of 0, we'll go back to this call, f of 1, and then we'll say, okay, we want it to return 1 times f of 0, and we now know the value of f of 0, which is 1, so we'll just say we're going to return 1 times 1, which is 1, from this function. And then we'll go back to this call, where n was 2, and we want it to return 2 times f of 1, whatever the return value of f of 1 was, and that turns out to be 1, so we'll return 2 times 1, which is 2 from this function. And then we'll just basically keep doing that. f of 3 wanted to return 3 times f of 2, and f of 2 happens to be 2 here, so we'll return 6 right here, and then we'll go back here, the original call that we made, and then f of 3 turns out to be 6, so we'll say, okay, f of 4, we want it to return 4 times whatever the return value of f of 3, which turns out to be 6, so we'll return 24 from this function, which is correct. And this wraps up this section about factorials. Let me know in a comment below if anything was unclear. Okay, now to better understand recursion, let's take a look at another example here, the Fibonacci sequence. So I already talked about this in one of my previous videos, but the Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of numbers that starts with two ones at the beginning, and the numbers after that are generated by adding up the two previous numbers. So for example, the third number is 2, because 1 plus 1 equals 2, and then the fourth number is 3, because 1 plus 2 equals 3, and so on, and then it just keeps on going forever. And given this sequence, Let's just say that we're trying to solve the problem of writing a function, let's say fib, which takes a positive integer n and returns the nth number in this sequence, the nth Fibonacci number. So if you're given 3 as n in this function, you should be able to find and return the third Fibonacci number, which is 2. And if you're given 4 as n, you want to be able to find and return the fourth Fibonacci number, which is 3 right here. Now, if you want to try solving this problem yourself, pause the video right here and post your solution in the comment below if you want to share it with others. Now, to solve this problem using recursion, you need to first formally define the relation between different Fibonacci numbers, just like we did with factorials. So for that, we're going to write fn equals fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. So I'm denoting the nth Fibonacci number as fn, and this is saying the nth Fibonacci number should be the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers. So an example here would be this one right here, f5 equals f4 plus f3. So this is saying the fifth Fibonacci number, f5 right here, should be the sum of the fourth Fibonacci number, this one right here, plus f3, which is this one right here. So just like we saw in the case of factorials, this equation is correct most of the time, but it's not complete. 
So if you plug in 5 to n, it's correct. This equation is still correct. But as soon as you plug in 2 to n, you get f2 equals f1 plus f0. And here, I didn't define f0, 0th Fibonacci number, I guess. So this equation just breaks. And it's the same thing. If we plug in 1 here, we have f1 equals f0 plus f minus 1. F1 is the first Fibonacci number, and F minus 1 is not defined, so this equation doesn't work for N equals 1 either. And to fix this equation, we need to actually rewrite it as two parts. The first part is going to be just like we saw, Fn equals Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2 if N is greater than or equal to 3. And then the second part will be Fn is equal to 1 otherwise and that's when n is equal to 1 or 2. Now, to solve the problem we saw earlier of writing a function called fib, we just need to translate this formal definition into code. Let's see how we can do that. I just wrote here, int fib int n, and this just means we're going to define a function called fib, which is going to return an integer, and then it's going to take n, which is an integer, as an argument. And then inside this function, I'm just going to, first of all, assume that the given n is a positive integer, just for simplicity. And then after that, I will say, if n is greater than or equal to 3, then return the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers, Fib of n minus 1 and Fib of n minus 2. And otherwise, n is equal to 1 or 2, so we're just going to return from this function. Okay, let's now take a look at a few examples here to see how this function works exactly. I'm just going to move this function over here. Okay, first of all, let's say this function fib is called with 3 as the argument. Then what happens is we go to this line right here. 3 is greater than or equal to 3. So we'll say, okay, the value, the return value of fib of 3 should be the sum of fib of 1 and fib of 2. So that's what I wrote here. Fib of 3 should be the sum of fib of 2 and fib of 1. And then in fib of 2, we'll go to this line right here because 2 is not greater than or equal to 3. So we'll return 1 from fib of 2. And just like that, we're going to return 1 from fib of 1 as well. And once we have these two numbers, fib of 2 will go in here and fib of 1 will go in here. So 1 will go in here and then 1 will go in here. So we're going to return 1 plus 1 and we're going to return 2 from our function. And that's the correct answer. By the way, just quickly about terminology. In a function that uses recursion, or in a recursive function, the condition where it doesn't call itself at all, but instead returns, for example, just a number, is called a base case. And then the condition where it calls itself is called a recursive case. So in this example, when n is greater than or equal to 3, that's a recursive case, and otherwise, that's a base case. Okay, let's take a look at another example here. Let's say this function fib is called 4 as the argument. That's this one right here. Then it goes to this line right here because n, which is 4, is greater than or equal to 3. So we want to return fib of 3 plus fib of 2 as the return value of fib of 4. So that's what I wrote here. The return value of fib of 4 should be the sum of the return value of fib of 3 and the return value for fib of 2. And when we hit that line right here, we don't know what the return value should be for fib of 3 yet, so we'll need to call it separately. And then the same thing will happen. We'll say, okay, whatever we return from fib of 3, that should be the sum of fib of 2 and fib of 1. So we'll call fib of 2. And then we'll say, okay, the return value for fib of 2 should be 1, because 2 is not greater than or equal to 3. So we'll go to this line right here, and then we'll return 1 from fib of 2. And then 1, we'll go in here. And then at this point, we'll know that we, we should return 1 plus fib of 1 from fib of 3. And so we're going to call fib of 1. And then it's the same thing. We'll return 1 from fib of 1. And then 1 will go in here, and then we'll say, okay, we should return 1 plus 1, which is 2 from fib of 3. 
So we'll plug in two right here, and then we'll say, okay, we should return two plus fable two from fable four, but we don't know what the value for fable two should be. So we're gonna call that. And then again, we'll say, okay, we should return one from fable two. So one will go in here, and then we have one for fable two and two for fable three at this point. So we're gonna return two plus one from fable four, which is three. And that's the correct answer because that's the fourth Fibonacci number. Okay, so that's one way to implement this function fib, but here you might notice that it's not the most efficient way to do it. To see why it's not the most efficient way to do it and to see how you can fix it, you can just check my video about dynamic programming. Okay, and this was number six of my data structures and algorithms series. You can find the entire series in the description below. Okay, so that is a recap of um, uh, recursive, how you calculate what is on what, what I shown you the previous slides, yeah, on a factorial and also Fibonacci. Uh, Fibonacci is in a second. But okay, now based on that video, I hope you can understand how you calculate and what is the stopping case, also the recursive case, also the how you trace back the factorial, the tracing back of this uh, recursive tracing back would be uh, shown in a later slide. Yeah? Now, looking at this principle of recursion, there are three. Number one, every recursive definition must have one or more stopping cases because it is depending on whether or not you put many call of functions for your recursive inside the body of your program. Next one, the recursive case, right? You remember recursive case must eventually be reduced to a stopping case. You have your stopping, uh, your, what do you call the recursive case? And then you have your uh, stopping case. Stopping case, remember that uh, you have the return to one. Recursive case, remember that you have your conditions. If uh, one is more or equals to, uh, if uh, yeah, if n is more or equals to zero, uh, one, yeah, that is your example of recursive case, right? Next one, the stopping case stops the entire um, program for recursion. Okay, these are the three principles of recursion. So this is the implementation of method factorial. Okay, so as you see here, I mentioned this, uh, this is your stopping case. In this case, in this factorial, yeah, this is your stopping case. And then return to one. Okay, else return to factorial n minus one. Okay, so these are the sample code which you have in chapter six. I think uh, I gave you some of it. So please refer to your coursework, right? Okay, next one is about stack. You know how stack works. Stack is a, a LIFO structure in computer memory. Basically, LIFO last in, first out. Uh, the last uh, in, uh, the last particular object that goes into the stack would be the one that will go out first, last in, first out. Okay, so for each method call, stack frame, or uh, you call it activation record, is allocated and pushed on the program stack. Okay, so structure will be looking like a box, like a stack uh, arranged one after another, okay, by looking at LIFO structure. So the stack frame stores the argument values, local variables, and return the address to the calling environment based on the its arrangement, uh, lowest to the highest weight from top to bottom. Okay, that is a um, structure of a stack how you know, you arrange your plates in a restaurant, the examples, and then you put all the plates, first thing goes in, the second goes up on top of it, and so forth, you know, about that. So that is how your argument values, your local variables, and your 
addresses okay will be uh, stored if it is in a stack structure so the active frame which is the current method call will be stored at the very top of the stack yeah so the one that you need to call method call will be sitting on top because that it will be executed first and after that ended uh, then that particular memory will be deallocated and give way to the next uh, operation to be executed until it returns back to your main program. Okay, so then it will terminate. This is recursive function stack video. Okay, um, this is how what I mentioned earlier, right, about how your stack is basically arranged in a box looking uh, structure where everything else will go right down here, okay, until it goes moving up until it reaches to your uh, method call, right? So this one is the illustration of that. Uh, let's see whether it is a long video. Let me see. Let's see. Yeah. This is the illustration of what is going on in the video, yeah? This is like how I mentioned earlier. First thing is, if you are to execute your program stack, let's just explain on this one first, yeah? Okay. First thing is that whatever you call first, okay, which is your main program, will go into the stack like this manner, okay, because the memory is empty, so it goes into the memory. And then the next program will go on top of each other and then until uh, the last one, which is n is equals to zero. So you know how stack works, it goes last in, which is referring to zero, will be the first one to go out. So when this has been computed, or executed, obviously it will be removed or deallocated from the memory in the stack. So therefore, that's why it has been deallocated, okay, um, terminated. So one that have, it will look into, this become the head of the stack and then therefore execute that. When that has been uh, executed, it will then terminate and deallocate until it goes into the last one, which is returning address of 25600,000. So then after that, one, once that has been executed, and then it will return back into empty stack, which is the memory has been allocated back to normal. Okay, so that is a request of calls in program stack, how you basically uh, see it is illustrated in a stack. So uh, we will watch the video later, yeah? But I need to explain this quickly first. Recursion trace one. So how do you basically trace? There's a method on how you look into that, which is like this one. Yeah, for example, you have box trace. We mentioned this last week, yeah? So similar to what has been described in the video over and over, this is your factorial uh, three. So how do you trace that? This is how you basically illustrate that. Uh, if you were to ask a question on how you trace, how you will give a box trace for factorial three, okay? So for here, starting from the top top uh, stage here, n is equivalent to three. So what happens is that you will return, system will return three, you multiply by factorial number two. So again here, it doesn't know what is factorial two. So it goes to the next one, which is n equals to two. Okay, so return two, uh, multiply or times factorial of one, you do not know what is factorial one. Again, you go next one, which is uh, n equals to one. So return one, okay, uh, multiply or, or times with factorial of zero. So if you see uh, in the solution previously, uh, and also the definition of factorial of zero, it always gives you one. That is basically returning to one. So therefore, you know that factorial of one, uh, zero is basically returning one. So then you trace back into into this box and then that 
obviously multiplying by itself, which is 1. 1 by 1 equals to 1. So therefore, next one, it goes back into here. Now you know what is n, which is sitting here, n is 1. So obviously, 2 times 1 gives you 2. So therefore, you have 2. And then obviously, you have settled this problem, and then it will keep referring to factorial 2, which is now 2. So now you have 3 multiplied by factorial 2, which is referring to this n2. Therefore, you get it 3 multiplied by 2, or 3 times 2, that is 6. Therefore, your value, your end result will be 6. So that's how you trace. First thing, you do not know what this is because you're trying to trace down uh, or, you know, your formula. You call it formula or calculation, right? And then it goes straight down until you reach to the bottom, which you get gives you uh, or return you the value of what is factorial 0, 1, and 2. Then in the end, you get your result, which is your answer for factorial. This is you do how you do a factorial box trace. There will be a questions uh, later on, uh, which I have shown you earlier uh, last week. So this is how you do a factorial if there is a question on this one. Yeah. Okay, next one. So this one is the elaboration of here. Yes. So it says here, you can illustrate the execution of a recursive method by doing a recursion trace or box trace. Each box corresponds to a recursive call in each box. Indicate the value of argument for the current method invocation, which is referring to this, this argument, yeah? Okay, so this will correspond to the next value because you want to know what value is this, therefore this will correspond to the next, until it reaches the point where you give a solution after you call so, several times of yourself into the last point, we get a value, and then again, you get that. You put that result, which is here, into that, because now you know what is this value until you have the answer. And then, you know, you keep going on until you reach a point where you return this and this, which gives you the last answer for that one. Okay. Okay. So each new recursive method call is indicated by a down arrow. Okay. This recursive function call, down arrow. Oops. Okay. And then when the method returns or the value which you have already identified at the lowest point, okay, which is returning to you one, therefore an upward arrow is drawn and return the values is indicated for this particular recursion trace or box trace. So this I have explained, yeah. First you have the uh, formula and then this returns three times this. You do not know this. You have to go back to the net. You have to go down to the next. And this returns this. You do not know that as well. You have to go down and until you reach one. And it goes and trace back way until you get six. Okay, that's it. So logically, you can think of a recursive method as having unlimited copies of itself. Uh, and then every recursive call has its own code. Every recursive call has its own code. Okay and its own set of parameters and local variables. All sets of parameters and local variables, yeah. After completing particular recursive call, the control goes back to the calling environment, which is the previous call. After you finish this, you go into the previous one, finish this, go to the previous, finish this, go to the previous, until you reach the top. Okay? The current recursive call must execute completely before control back to the back goes back to the previous call. The execution in the previous call begins from the point immediately following the recursive call. It says you have to complete this in order to uh, execute this. Finish this first and you execute this. Finish and complete, then execute this, execute this, and then finish with this one. Then only then this will end, okay? So that's uh, what it means here. Next one. Now, this is the ex uh, exercise of recursive method. So it gives you this kind of um, function, right? Of some series n equals to 1 plus half plus uh, 1 over 3 plus until you reach 1 over n. So where n always is a positive integer value. So for example, if n is basically 2, okay, n is 2, the method performs a computation which is 1 plus half, which is referring to 1 
plus 0 0.5. Okay, this one will be 0 0.5. This one will be 0 0.33. Yeah, I think it's 0 0.33. Yeah. All right. So therefore, uh, yeah, this one is greater than five. Okay. So what happened here? Oops. This is uh, how you write the particular uh, function, right? You have public double sum series. You declare it as double sum series int of n, okay? So if you have n is less than equals less or equals to 0, you return 0, 0.0, okay? Else, if n is equals to 1, therefore you return 1. And another one is that else return your sum series, which is n minus 1 plus 1.0. Okay, this one program is basically in correspond to the next question. Okay, this is, but for this particular question, if you were asked to compute and, and write a function for that, this is how you should write. Okay, uh, you have to put everything in your, your, uh, your condition and then uh, what other one is here the next one first second and then after that your uh, return values yeah stop in case yeah next one perform a box trace this is exercise number two which is corresponding to the value or information which is over here yeah also so perform a box trace from the method call some series three Okay, your sum series is your call function sum series three. Remember for each method call, indicate the argument value statement executed and the return value for each box. So how do you solve that? So you define as this, you double your double result equals to sum series three. Okay, this is a tracing, right? Box trace. So what happened here? You have n is equivalent to three, sub series three. So n is equivalent to three. And then you return your sum series 2, okay? Sum series 2, uh, then you plus with the next one, which is, you, you do not know this first, yes? So you put 0 0.33, which is referring to this value, okay? You're going from this value to this value and to this value. So this is the top part going to second part and first part here. And then uh, n equals to 2. So you return some series of 1 plus 0 0.5, which is uh, 1 over 2. Yeah. So therefore, you reach the, the next one, which is n equals to 1, return 1. When you have n equals to 1, therefore, of course, obviously, you have to return 1. So 1 goes here, some series, because you don't know what this is this value is so you get this it put it in here one plus 0 0.5 gives you 1.5 okay and then after that again you go back here you now you have the value of 1.5 so you put it in here 1.5 plus uh, 0 0.33 therefore you get a value of 1.83 okay so similar concept but this is how you do it if it is referring to asking you perform a box trace for method call sub series three. So sub series three obviously asking you to to state that your n value is three. Okay. So some series which is referring to the previous information. Okay, that's why it gives you this value of half, one over three, and uh, yeah, this is basically number three. Okay, exercise six point through two. Okay, now, when designing your recursive solution, method definition must provide parameter leads to different cases uh, which you have. Okay, the cases which refers to all the these cases, yeah. And then typically includes an if or switch statement, okay. One or more of these cases you provide a non-recursive solution or you call it stopping base, okay. You need to have stopping base so that you can stop the execution of recursiveness where it calls itself and then it's you know giving you value of itself again and again and again so you have to have a stopping case to stop that so that you don't experience a stack overflow okay 
one of the more cases includes recursive invocation takes a step towards the stopping case. Okay, so you give your condition and after that, uh, which leads to your stopping case. Okay, that's why you call it that. So now this is general structure of how you have many kinds of program that also like we have uh, explained to you last week, there are A, B, C. A being that stopping case and recursive case have different actions. Okay, so this is an example of that. If the stopping case is reached, then what you do, you solve the problem. Otherwise, you recurse, recursively solve smaller version of the problem until you reach uh, the stopping case is reached again. Okay, so first, stopping case is reached, you solve the problem. Otherwise, you do this until you reach, and then you go back into here, refer it, refer back to your stopping case. If it's fulfilled, like fulfilling that condition, then solve the problem. Otherwise, again, do this. Uh, next one, stopping case and recursive case have common action. So basically, if it is performing the same common step, if your recursive case, okay, uh, fulfilling your recursive case, so what you do is recursive solve smaller version of the problem, okay? And then you stop right there if you your recursive case is reached. The third one is or C. Stopping case has no actions to be performed. It's just straightforward, very simple. So if your recursive case is reached, therefore recursively solve smaller problem, and then that's the end after you have reached your recursive case. That is uh, one, two, and three. Implementation is here. Uh, which you can find in your countdown.java, which I have already given it to you. Yeah, please search um, and refer to the coursework. Yeah, I think it is all there. One uh, down, countdown one and two and three, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so okay. And then you have public void countdown. Int is uh, defined, your integer n. And then if your n is equals to one system out print line and then else system out print line. So come down and then you give you return of uh, n minus one. Okay, so this is basically implementation of one. So observation from this particular code is that it is redundant. Okay, uh, there is a double print line statement occurs in both cases. Okay, so and then the stopping case is considered first, which is you know, st uh, stated here in this manner. Your return case would be here. Uh, okay, so this is a uh, countdown.java implementation one, yeah? Which is referring to, I need to go back to the piece. Yeah, here, implementation one. Next one. Implementation, uh, which was number two, yeah, here. Implementation two, observation, uh, you have the public void countdown. Again, you have your integer n. And then if you define this n more or equals to one, therefore you print out n. And then you count down uh, n minus one. So over here, your redundant print line, which you have, your previous one, has been reduced, have been deleted, yeah, have been uh, uh, omitted out. So therefore, what happened here is that next one. Here, okay. So the recursive, recursive case is checked, okay. When n is one, n is one is this method will invoke the recursive call countdown zero, okay. Countdown zero means n minus one if n is one. Right, so n and uh, one minus one is zero. So this is a stopping case, and there is there will be no action performed after that. So that's the end. Now, next one is your implementation number three. So based on this uh, code, you have even more simpler. Okay, where your method is first invoked. Okay, this is a method, uh, and then the current n value is first displayed. And then your recursive case is checked. So this version uh, uses n more than one in comparison to instead of using n more than or equals to one. Okay, straightforward. So therefore, 
we'll have one less recursive call compared to the previous one, which is here. Okay, so this one you have a wider comparison, which means that your n more or equals to the one previously is just sort of straightforward. It's just wanting to see if your n is more than one. Otherwise, you uh, execute and then you display only what is required, which is if n is more than one, therefore n minus one. Okay, otherwise, n the recursive column. So that is implementation number three. Again, box trace for method countdown three, which is here. Is this uh, public static void countdown int three? Okay, countdown three, you have integer display uh, uh, stated as defined as three. So display three, countdown two. Okay, next, what is countdown two? Two would be here, display two. Okay, countdown one. What is one? One is equals to n is equals to one. So therefore, you have one. Countdown one, basically, you have uh, countdown one here, display uh, n. Uh, to the uh, n is equals to 2. So, and then again, it goes back into what is countdown 2. Countdown 2, basically, you're trying to get, uh, yeah, which is 2, n is equals to 2. So, 3 times 2 makes basically gives you that uh, 6. Yeah? yeah. So, this is how it performs you very simple, straightforward uh, if more n is more than 1. Okay. So, you don't have any more. Uh, you just display, you have that, and you display. You have that, and you display, you have that, you have this, you just display. No other computation. So these are the steps for designing recursive method. One, two, three. First thing is you have to identify and list all your stopping base cases based on what, what uh, recursive case that you have. Okay, List all the stopping base cases based on recursive cases. Number two, list the recursive cases. Okay, ensure that each recursive case takes a step towards one of the stopping cases, which is referring to that. Number three, arrange the cases in the correct sequence based on how you are going to execute that based on like this and like such. Yeah. So that next time when you want to do a box trace, it's easier for you to locate. All right. So this is uh, exercise 6.3, mathematical function of C and uh, uh, and k as the n values, okay? So computes the number of possible uh, combination for selecting k objects out of n and is defined as if k is zero, if k is n, k more than n, if zero less than k, less than n. So uh, these are your formula, right? A recursive method which computes c, n, and k. Object of k out of n. So this is your uh, example of program or solution. So project int c int n if your k is in k. Okay, so we have to get all this value here inserted. Yeah, if k is equals to zero, right, uh, or k is equals to n, right. So return one. Else, if k more than n, return zero. Else. Return C because we have a uh, value of C, like N, right? This one. So N minus 1, K minus 1, plus C, N minus 1, and K. Okay, so that is basically uh, referring to this, right? So this is your recursive examples uh, program. Uh, all you have to do is just you need to uh, understand how this works and what this means if you want to insert everything inside the program. Okay, so if you don't, cannot understand that, then therefore, you know, uh, you will get a little bit confused. Okay, so basically what you have explained here, illustrate all this, okay, until the end, you get to execute this. Okay, so you're just simply trying to show what this uh, particular uh, definitions is required to be shown in your program. Public int c int n and int k. If k, okay, 
resting is uh, equals to zero or k is equals to n. Right, then you have to return one. Else k is more than n, then you return a zero. Else you get this one to be displayed here. So this is a solution for function c, n, and k. So how do you recursively processing an array? This one is another way on how you actually do, you want to process your information, uh, your functions in your array recursively. So what you do here is this, you need to divide it into two pieces. First element, one piece, rest of array, another. Last element, one piece, rest of array, another. And then divide array into two halves, which is shown here. Okay. You, uh, yeah, you, because you want to implement recursiveness, right, in your array. So you can do up and you can do bottom. So you process both and you produce a solution. A recursive method part of an implementation of an entity is often private. It's necessary to parameters make it unsuitable as an entity operation. Okay, so that is about recursive processing of array. It's quite complicated, right, array? So sample code for how you process an array will be that. Okay, I think I have it here. Let's see. Oh, uh, here. Yeah, I should make that before. So. Okay, so wait for a second, yeah. We need to do, yeah. So, so it says just now it has to be private, right? A recursive method of an implementation of an entity. Abstract data type is often private. Private in the sense that you need to have necessary parameters defined in each of your uh, function, which is here: display array one, display array two, display array three. So everything has to be. Uh, on its own executed first before it move on to the next one. Yeah, so display for display array one, first thing function is to display a first array of the element because you want to display top part first, yeah, or, or you call it first array element, and then recursively displays the rest. Or you go for display array two, display the last array element after recursively <coughs> displaying all the preceding element. And the last but not least, divides both of array in two halves and then recursively display the left subarray and the right subarray elements. Okay, it's like such. Two arrays with middle elements within left halves. So you execute here and you execute here, right? So into B. Rest you want to show is display array one, first array, and then recursively display the rest one. And then you want to display the rest. After that, you want to start from the end, which is from here, which is coming for display array number two. Display the last array element after recursively displaying all the preceding element. Okay. And after that, when you do divide the array into two halves and then recursively, recursively perform side by side this, display that, and display this. Okay. So basically, this is how recursive uh, apply in array. Okay recursively processing an array because as you know it is calling itself after uh, over and over repeatedly until it reaches into a certain point so how it implement in array is by dividing into half so you call this one first finish with that one and then you can call the second one okay so you sit in the middle so this one is basically showing you that example how you calculate an array. Maybe I can show you this here so I can understand. So now let's take a look at some recursive algorithms that work on arrays and how we can implement those in Java. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sum everything in an array. Obviously, the best way to do this is just to use a for loop. Again, here we're doing these methods recursively just as an exercise. In practice, always pick the best method for what you're trying to do. But again, this is for purposes of illustration, not for purposes of efficiency. Just your volume if it is, you can so here we have an array. 
three, two, four, six, okay. one, five. Now we can think of the sum of this array recursively by saying that the sum of this array is three plus the sum of the remaining array, two, four, six, one, five. And furthermore, the sum of this array is two plus the sum of four, six, one, five. And that sum is four plus the sum of six, one, five. And the sum of six, one, five is six plus the sum of one and five and so on, one plus five, until finally we get to five plus the sum of the empty list. Well, the sum of the empty list is zero. And so now we backtrack through our recursion. Five plus the sum of the empty list is five plus zero, which is five. We return that value. So now we have one plus that sum gives us six. We return that, add six to that, and we get 12. Return again, now, 4 plus 12 is 16. We're going to add that sum to 2 to give us 18. And then finally, we're going to add 3 to that result, which is 18, to give us 21. So I've started off here with a main method. I have an array of integer arrays that we'll use for testing. And I also have a method I wrote to convert an array to a string with all the elements in it. And we'll use this to print the arrays just so that we can check our work as we go along. So our first method, we'll return an int, and it'll take an integer array. This is going to sum the array. If you'll remember, what we want to do is we want to take the first thing off the array and sum the rest. Now, we could create new arrays each time, but that's very inefficient. A better way to do this is to keep track where we are in the array and sum from there to the end of the array. So in order to do this, we're going to create a helper method. And we'll pass it nums and zero, zero being the starting point where we want to add things up from. So our helper method is going to take an array of integers and an index. For our base case, if the index is greater than or equal to nums.length, that's an invalid index. So now we've gotten to the end of the array. And we can say that that's, and once that happens, there's no need to calculate any further because we're at the end of the array. There's no more elements left. So their sum is zero. Otherwise, we're going to return nums of index plus the sum of the array nums starting at index plus one. And that is all we need. So let's write some test code. So we'll print a header. And just like we've done in the past, we'll do a for each loop that iterates over all of these arrays, printing out the result of calling some array. Get it. is for efficiency sake, which granted, okay, we're using recursion, we're already throwing efficiency out the door. But again, creating new arrays and copying values is really slow. So we use this trick where we just use the index to tell us where in the array we are. So keep that in mind, because we'll change that with our next example. So our next example, we're going to be checking what I'm going to call the fold balance of an array. So here we have an array. Okay, that's going to be our long one. So we will continue with our next slides here. We're just trying to finish first the slides and then we come back with this one because I want to show you more important uh, video compared to this one. Yeah, because this one is already been explained. Okay, I, I'm going to move on to the next slides for now. Okay, next one is recursively processing a link chain. 
your sample code is your simple list. Basically, how this has happened for recursive uh, processing of link is just to apply it on a link chain. So how you do that, consider the private to string method, which you have in simple list dot Java processes a chain of link nodes, you know what link list is, right? So basically it processes a chain of link nodes recursively. Okay. Uh, use a reference to the chain's uh, first node as methods parameter, then process the first node, followed by the rest of the chain node recursive call. Okay, so how would a link list work? Link list, obviously, a chain link list would be working from one node which has the address of the next node. Next node will have the list of address of the next node. Yeah, so that's how you recursively implement uh, recursiveness in the link list by referring to the next address or the reference um, uh, node. So uh, you have to refer to a simple list Java. Let's see whether you have it here. Okay, so uh, this one, um, maybe you can check on the simple list Java, right? Yeah, hang on a second. Yeah, maybe I can show you that. Wait a second. Simple list. Simple list. Ah, yeah, here it is. Okay, so I've given you this simple uh, sample code, simplelist.java. So you have public class simplelist. Invoke a private recursive to string method, right? So uh, then you have to, this is how you set it, right? For simplelist, t, initiate values uh, for this one is your uh, case. Yeah, and then uh, your integer i equals to initiate values and length. Okay, those basically all your arguments which you state. And then your note, new node equals to you calling into the uh, next node reference of the first node and then first node to the new node. So that is basically how you trying to make it recursive by referring from one first node to the next node. And the next node, if it is not achieved for this particular, uh, sorry, which is, ah, uh, yeah. So therefore, you go back to the next node. Okay, so what's, what's the other one? If your current node equals to null, you return your uh, uh, new node. Okay. Else, you return your current node, and then you get into that current node displayed. So... Uh, private class node, so this is defined as private t data private node next, and then you have private node node for your t data is defined here. Then you call this data for that particular data, and then this next will be now, and then you end constructor. Okay, so this is the definition of how this particular is going to be called into this. Okay, so this is a representation of how your linked list is defined in a recursive implementation, just a simple implementation of link. Yeah. Editor, okay. So try on that one. Okay. So basically the uh, code a while ago is trying to explain how processes of chain of link loads nodes are recursively implemented. Uh, it says it uses a reference to the chain first node. First thing you saw a while ago, there was a first node reference. And then as the methods parameter, then uh, if that is just achieved, then you process to the first node, followed by the rest of the other chain. Okay, that means uh, you set your uh, algorithm, okay, which will fill in your case. 
and then if that is not achieved you do a recursive call by looking and searching for the next node and returning back into the main node if that particular uh, argument is achieved similar to how you write a function some other different functions it always try to fulfill what you your arguments are which you state in the first uh, uh, first definition, first line of which you define your case and if that is not fulfilled then you recursively find the solution until you reach into that stage where you found what do you, uh, is the program is looking for until that particular case argument is achieved. So similar concept, yeah? And then this is a countdown method. This is looking at time efficiency between recursive methods which you can use okay so number one here you are use we are calling upon the countdown method so this is how you actually uh, implement countdown okay public static void countdown integer n so what do you do is you print out the value and then you have to fulfill if n is more than one and then you uh, display countdown n equals to uh, minus one, okay? Okay, you just hang on a second. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, well, uh, now we're going to look into a different methods, which is showing you the Tower of Hanoi. Okay, this one we already mentioned and uh, show you how it is computed for how you transfer all these tests into the next peg. Okay, this is basically just to show you an illustration of recursiveness, where it goes. Uh, recursively trying to go into uh, each of this peg which is considered as itself a uh, similar location of itself and then uh, trying to find how it reaches into the last uh, peg you know this last location without having to violate uh, the rules of transfer okay so this one is a video on tower of hanoi we're going to go into that you uh, will have to go into that yourself, yeah? So I, I mean, have previously shown you simple solution to difficult problems referring to Tower of Hanoi. Uh, yeah, one is the, these are the rules, one, two, three. Yeah, move one disk at a time. Okay, uh, each disk you must, your move must be topmost disk. No disk may rest on top of a disk smaller than itself. Yes, you can store disk on the second pole temporarily as long as you observe the previous two rules, which is move one disk at a time. And then move one, move, uh, you move, each disk you move must be a topmost disk. No disk may rest on top of a disk smaller than itself. Okay, so that needs to be fulfilled, mandatory rule. So, okay, uh, you go slowly and read on that one because I already explained on this one, yes? So basically at the end, uh, if you are to follow rules number one, two, three, you will eventually reach the end uh, of peg number three, where you have, which currently under A, goes straight into C in an orderly manner, without having to have a uh, larger disk on top of the smaller disk, if you can see. See, this one goes into that and that. Everything is arranged properly without having to have the bigger disk on top of the smaller disk. And then you basically be at the end of this solution, you reach C, destination, fulfilling all the requirements. Okay, so this one is another smaller problem in a recursive solution of four disks. Okay, same concept where it eventually goes into the last one. Now, this is the algorithm which solved the Tower of Hanoi. Okay, so this is just trying to illustrate on how you fulfill the rules of moving from one disk into another disk by explaining it, explaining it, implementing it, it and your code. Okay, so 
this is your advantage of recursion. Uh, recursive implementation can be significantly simpler and easier to understand than its uh, iterative counterpart. Uh, okay, so basically you can either use recurs recursion or iterative, but it says <clears throat> it says sometimes simpler this recursive and easier to understand than recursion uh, than iteration. Recursive approach to algorithm allows us to take advantage of repetitive structure present in many problems. Okay, for example, you have one folder, you have another folder inside that folder, and you have subfolders, which is inside that subfolder of the first folder. So how you solve that is that you keep going into each of the folder until you reach to the last folder where you can find the file that you want. Similar concept with recursion. Okay, so you go deeper into the code, which you have set your argument for your case, and that is basically implemented, solved, deallocated, and go, you slowly deallocate it and go back into the main, uh, main program that basically initiate the whole argument one by one. Okay, so by making our algorithm description, uh, exploit this repetitive structure in a recursive way, we can often avoid complex case analysis and nested loops which is basically uh, illustrated in iterative implementation. Okay, you have that in your iteration implementation. Um, now you have in reference to solution for a simpler problem, which one would you be able to, which one would be a, pro, a better solution if you would compare with recursive? Um, one of the core solution to simple problem would be uh, illustrated in Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci um, states that when you want to proceed to the next value, uh, the next value, the amount of the next value will be the uh, addition or combination of the first value and the next value. Okay, first two numbers of sequence are one and one. Okay, so successive, successive numbers are the sum of the previous two. Okay, this is illustrated here. One and one. This will go to the next one. Okay, with the third value, that will be the sum of the first value and the second value. Okay, for the fourth value, fourth value will be the sum of first, uh, second value, and the third value, and so forth, right? Until you reach the end, but it goes incrementally higher and higher value, so that's basically getting more and more uh, complicated as it will occupy a lot of memory and that's quite expensive to execute. So that's why it is uh, says that it's a poor solution to a simple problem because, you know, uh, inefficient in the sense that it keeps incremental, incrementing, okay, uh, for solution. So this is your recursive algorithm illustration of your code uh, algorithm for Fibonacci n. If n is less or equals to 1, you return to 1. Else, you compute Fibonacci n minus 1, which is the previous number, plus with your Fibonacci n minus 2, which is the second uh, number in the line. Okay, just like as I have illustrated previously, which is referring to these values. So this is a recursive Fibonacci, right? Uh, I'm not sure if you have watched. Uh, no, I'm, we obviously you didn't have this. Yeah, but okay, we're going to go this very quickly. And we're going to move towards different types of recursion to complete the whole chapter. Okay. In this video, we are going to write a program to generate Fibonacci numbers in Java. The basic recursive algorithm that everybody comes up with turns out to be really slow once you start giving it some higher numbers. So I'm also going to show you a way to make that algorithm way faster while still being recursive. My name is John. I'm a lead Java software engineer, and I love sharing what I've learned with you in a clear and understandable way. I also have a full Java course available in a link down in the description if you're interested. Let's get right into it. Before we jump right into Eclipse and start coding, let's first do a quick refresh on what the Fibonacci sequence is. The Fibonacci 
Fibonacci sequence is just a sequence of numbers that starts with zero and then one, and then each number after that is just the sum of the previous two numbers. So for the next number, we which is one, and then one plus one is two. One plus two is three, two plus three is five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, and it just keeps going like that forever. So what the program we're going to write will do is take in a number. Let's say we take in the number six. Our program will then return the sixth number in the Fibonacci sequence. So if our program is given the number six, it should return the zero, one, two, three, four, five, six number in the sequence, which is the number eight. So first, let's declare an int, we'll just call it n. This is going to be the number in the Fibonacci sequence that we are going to return. So if we use uh, the number six, then our program should return the sixth number in the Fibonacci sequence, which should be eight. We'll just go ahead and start with the number six and use that. If you need to take this number in as input from the user, maybe you're doing this for a homework assignment or something, I have another video here all about getting user input in Java. It'll be really easy to just swap this out with a number that the user inputs. So to generate the nth Fibonacci number, we're actually going to be calling a method that we create here. We'll call the method Fibonacci, and we'll just pass in the number n. Of course, this method doesn't exist yet. We haven't created it yet. But in Eclipse, if you just hover over this, it gives you an option to automatically create that Fibonacci method. So just click on that, and there you go. We do have to change this generated method in one way though. Right now, the return value is void. In our case though, of course, we want it to actually return a number, whatever the nth number in the Fibonacci sequence is. Since these numbers can get pretty big, I think we should go ahead and use a long as the return type here. So if you're writing this method out manually, it's just private static long Fibonacci, and it takes in one parameter, an int n, so that we can find the nth Fibonacci number. Okay, so let's think through for a second what our algorithm actually has to do. So when we want to generate the nth Fibonacci number, so let's say our n is 6. So the 6th Fibonacci number is 8, but how is that calculated? So the 6th Fibonacci number is actually just the 5th Fibonacci number plus the 4th Fibonacci number. So we can say that the nth Fibonacci number is just equal to the n minus 1th Fibonacci number plus the n minus 2 Fibonacci number. So if n equals 6, we're going to add the 5th Fibonacci number and the 4th Fibonacci number. And we can code that pretty easily. So if we want to just find uh, the Fibonacci number at n, all we have to do is return the Fibonacci number at n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci number at n minus 2. But is it really that simple? Let's give it a run and see what it does. Okay, so it immediately blows up with uh, this huge exception. Uh, and if you scroll all the way to the top here, it says it's a stack overflow error. Well, what we've got here is a case of infinite recursion. So what's happening here is when you pass in some number like sixth, in order to find the sixth Fibonacci number, all I need to do is find the fifth Fibonacci number and the fourth Fibonacci number and add them together. But of course, to find the fifth Fibonacci number, it has to call this method again, where it calls itself again. And those recursive method calls are just gonna keep going over and over again, deeper and deeper. But in Java, you're limited to how deep those method calls can go. So eventually, once you get too deep, you get a stack overflow error. So how can we prevent that? Well, what we need to have, just like you need to have in every single recursive algorithm, is what's called a base case. A base case is a condition inside your recursive method, where when that condition is met, it doesn't make a recursive call. So each recursive algorithm always needs a base case to prevent it from recursing infinitely. So in the case of our Fibonacci program, what exactly is our base case? So let's look at the Fibonacci sequence and think about it. The rules are that the first two numbers are going to be zero and one. And then after that, each subsequent number is generated by adding the previous two. So for the Fibonacci sequence, the base case is that the zeroth Fibonacci number is zero, and the first Fibonacci number is one. The zeroth and first Fibonacci numbers are going to be hard-coded. That's going to be our base case. So we're gonna put our base case here above this return statement. So if n is less than or equal to one, we are just going to return n. So if n is zero, it'll return zero, and if n is one, it'll return one. Let's run our program again and see if it works. Well, that time our program didn't blow up with an exception, but it also didn't 
print out anything. And that's probably because we aren't printing out anything yet. All we're doing is calling this method. So, so system.out.println Fibonacci of n. So let's give that another try. Okay, so it printed out eight and eight is correct. Eight was the sixth Fibonacci number. So let's do a couple more here. So the ninth Fibonacci number should be 34. Let's change this to a nine and run it again. And we should get, yep, we get 34. All right, so the program seems to be working. Let's see how high we can make our N before our program gets really, really slow. So first let's increase it to 30. It took about a second. So that finished pretty quickly. Let's step that up to 50. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I guess this is my life now. Okay, so getting the 50th Fibonacci number took about two minutes or so with our recursive algorithm. So we're gonna need to make this a lot faster, but why is it already taking so long for such a small input like 50? Let's look at a simple case where we just wanna return like the fifth Fibonacci number. So to return the fifth Fibonacci number, we have to find the fourth Fibonacci number and add it to the third Fibonacci number. Well, okay, but to find the fourth Fibonacci number, then we have to find the third Fibonacci number and add it to the second Fibonacci number. And of course that just keeps going. So in order to find the third Fibonacci number, you first have to find the second Fibonacci number and add it to the first Fibonacci number. And that keeps going down until you finally hit that base case of the zero or first Fibonacci number. But that's not even half the battle. Of course, all of this was just so that we could find the fourth Fibonacci number. We still separately have to find the third Fibonacci number. And the problem with this algorithm is that we keep having to recalculate all of these Fibonacci numbers that we already have solved. For example, finding the fourth Fibonacci number, we have to find the third and the second. So back up here where we're trying to get the third Fibonacci number again, it's doing all of those recursive calculations again. So it ends up having to do the same calculations many, many times. And the higher our N goes, the higher Fibonacci number we're looking for, the number of calculations this is having to do increases exponentially. So the program starts getting super slow very quickly. So how can we fix that? So right now, for example, when it's trying to do this calculation and it's trying to find the fourth Fibonacci number, in there it has to do the calculation for the third Fibonacci number. But when it finds the solution for the third Fibonacci number, it doesn't save it somewhere, it just throws it out. So that later on when we're trying to calculate the other half of this, we need to know the third Fibonacci number again. But we didn't save the result of this calculation off somewhere, so we have to recalculate it again. So what we can do is exactly that. We can save the result of calculating a certain Fibonacci number, so that later on when we need to calculate that exact same Fibonacci number again, we can just look up that value that we all calculated instead of redoing all those calculations all over again. That type of strategy in an algorithm is called memoization, not memorization, memoization. So let's go ahead and implement that strategy into our Fibonacci program and see how much faster it gets. So the first thing we're going to need is somewhere we can store the results of all these calculations so that we can look them up from there later instead of recalculating it. To do that, I think we're going to use an array. So up here at the top of our program, we can create a private static a long array, an array of longs. We'll call it Fibonacci cache. Then down here in our main method, just after we initialize n, we're going to initialize this Fibonacci cache. So Fibonacci cache equals new long array. We need to give it a size here, and we actually need to give it a size of n plus one. So why n plus one and not just n? Let, let's say we had to just calculate the third Fibonacci number. Zero, one, two, three. So uh, the third Fibonacci number is two. So we have to create an array of size four if we want to calculate the third Fibonacci number. So that's why we have to use n plus one here for the size. So now what do we have to add down here in our Fibonacci method to implement that? The first thing is here right now where we're just returning the result of this calculation, we want to first store the result of that calculation in our array so that later if we need that same result again, we can just look it up. So here let's go ahead and create a long, we'll call it nth Fibonacci number and set that equal to the result of this calculation here. So we'll just cut and paste and we're going to be returning that same number just like we were before. But instead of doing that right away, First, we want to store this n Fibonacci number in our Fibonacci cache. So we're going to take Fibonacci cache at 
n, so the nth spot in our Fibonacci cache, we're going to set it equal to the nth Fibonacci number that we just calculated. But we don't yet have anything in our algorithm that would actually use the values in this cache. We're actually going to put that logic right here. So after our base case, what we can do is just check. We can look and see if the Fibonacci cache already has that value in it. So we can say Fibonacci if Fibonacci cache at n uh, does not equal zero. The reason that we want to look for not equals zero instead of not equals null is because uh, here in our array, we're using a primitive long and primitives can never be null. So this is just not an option for, for us. Instead of defaulting to null, a primitive long will default to zero if it hasn't been set. So if we look up the nth value in our cache and we get something that isn't zero, we know that we have already calculated it and stored it in the cache, and we just need to use it. So we can just return Fibonacci cache at n. So in the case that we've already done the calculations for that Fibonacci number and stored it in the cache, we don't have to do any of those extra calculations again. We can just stop there and return the value that we already found. Let's first make sure that it all just still works. So the six Fibonacci number should still be eight. And it is, so it's still working fine. So now let's crank it up and set this back to a 50. Remember before this took quite a while. Let's see how much faster it is now with our memoization. Go ahead and run it. And it's done pretty much immediately. It took less than a second. Going from taking a couple of minutes down to less than a second is a huge improvement with such a simple change like using memoization. Before we finish here, because you stuck around, uh, let's improve this. Instead of just returning the, let's have it print out all the Fibonacci numbers up until that point. In order to do that, we can just use a for loop. So for int i equals zero, while i is less than or equal to n i plus plus, then we just need to take this line and paste it here into our for loop. Then we need to just change this n to be i instead. Also, in order to print it out uh, more as a sequence all in one line instead of one number per line, instead of a print ln, we'll just do print so it prints it all in one line. And we also need to add a space in here. Otherwise, all the numbers are just going to be crammed together with no spaces in between and we won't be able to tell which number is which. That should be all we need. Now let's go ahead and run it and it should print out all the Fibonacci numbers up to and including the 50th Fibonacci number. And here we go, we start with 0, 1, 1, 2, all the way up. But you might be asking though, how high can this get? So let's give it a try. Let's step this up to 100 and run it and see what happens. And it seems like it might have worked okay, but if you take a look here, this number is ne negative and none of our results should ever be negative. That doesn't make any sense. And if you keep scrolling back, you'll see some numbers are positive, but some are negative. So here's why that's happening. So over here in our code, we're using a long in order to do our calculations, right? And that's fine. Long does hold very large numbers, but there's a limit. And it turns out that this is the maximum value that you can store. So that would be, let's see, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions. So longs can only store a little over nine quintillion which is a huge number, but remember the Fibonacci numbers are growing exponentially. And so even when you're just looking for the hundredth Fibonacci number, the numbers that we're calculating are already higher than the maximum value of a long. So we're limited by that here in our Java program. After playing around with this for a while, I think the limit uh, in our Java program because of the limitations of the long primitive data type are going to be uh, looking for the 92nd Fibonacci number. So with that, it looks like there's no negative values. With that, we go up to about seven and a half quintillion. But once we step that up to 93, that's when we start running into some negative values, unfortunately. So that's gonna be our limit. This works up to uh, finding the 92nd Fibonacci number. If you enjoyed this video or learned something, please let me know by leaving a like and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss each new Java tutorial. If there's something you wanna see, let me know in the comments and you might see it in a future video. Of course, don't stop now and keep your Java learning momentum Okay, that's pretty much sum up all the next topic, which is on Fibonacci as well. All right, so 
uh, as usual, we will continue the next one. This one I have actually shown you that this one also has already been included in the uh, video. <clears throat> how your Fibonacci is being increased, incre incremented, right? So uh, everything is already covered in the video. So I will just allow you to read on that one, yeah? Just as this one. Okay, so we shall continue for types of recursion uh, later on at 2 p.m. This is just very quickly. See this just less. Uh, yeah, for you, one, two, three, four. Six, seven slides, and we can go for your practical after that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, before we conclude this session in the morning and go towards the next session in the evening, afternoon, and you have any questions that you would like to forward? Uh, no. No? Yes? No. Okay, uh, if you cannot uh, understand some of it, maybe you can, uh, I will give you <clears throat> the, uh, this copy of the note, yeah? And then you can uh, slowly go, as you go along doing your assignment, not assignment, the practical, you'll be able to uncover which part that you cannot understand in the slides, yeah? Because there are some parts which are, you know, quite quite complicated if you don't <clears throat> know the code for uh, basically explanation of each uh, implementation, especially looking at stacks and link list, link list, right? And <clears throat> towards the next slide, we'll be referring to the types of recursion. So we have four four types that we're going to discuss or going to show you later on. Yeah. Okay, so Calvin, okay? Noel is okay, Calvin? Okay. All right, so with that, we will conclude the session. Uh, I will see you later at 2. Yeah? All right, okay. thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, Miss.